just four weeks after a gunman had murdered 12 people in Cumbria, another deranged killer was on the loose. This time in the genteel woods and lanes of the next door county, Northumbria. Hello there, this is the gunman from Bertie last night. My name is Raoul Moat. I'm coming to get you, I'm not on the run. I am coming to get you. Armed with a sawn off shotgun and a bag of homemade bullets, Raoul Moat murdered a man he didn't know, blinded another he'd never met, and maimed the woman he claimed to love. You killed me and him before that trigger was ever pulled. So what did he to kill myself? Well, I'm going to give you a chance because I am going for officers now. Moat's rampage sparked one of the biggest manhunts in British police history. But still, he managed to evade capture for seven terror-filled days, threatening that innocent members of the public would die. In a bloody final act, he dodged justice by turning his gun on himself. Durham Prison, 2010. Incarcerated among the murderers, rapists and robbers was a mountain of a man, Raoul Moat. A former bodybuilder and nightclub doorman, 37-year-old Moat was coming towards the end of an 18-week sentence for battering a young child. But Moat, a father of five, claimed it was he who was the victim of continual police harassment. In his mind, he was certainly being victimised. I don't think it was an official police policy to, to victimise Ron, but I think that he probably did have some grievances which might have been genuine. Inside him, he had this burning hatred of the police and nothing could change Moat in his feelings about the police. It was by no means a high-priority offender or target for the, for the police. It was, it was somebody who, you know, would show up on our radar. He, he had been arrested something like... Uh, 12 times over a 10-year period, which I would suggest isn't that excessive. Uh, but he was also known f f for some of his domestic uh, dealings with former partners, domestic incidents uh, where the police were involved. Raoul Moat saw himself as being persecuted by the social services. He recorded hours of conversations with officials, which he believed highlighted how they were trying to destroy his life. I've had enough of the way you are going on. I've had enough, right? She is an absolute liar. I can prove it, right? At no point have I raised my voice or intimidated either or mentioned where she lives or mentioned about how much money she gets, and I can prove this 100%. It's not a fuzzy recording, it's absolute crystal clarity. Special notes, social services are Due to a number of domestic incidents, social workers considered him to pose an unpredictable and violent threat. Moat's conviction for assault on a child meant it was the first time he'd been banged up. But while he was inside, it seemed those around him took their chance to break free from his controlling influence. If Tentley wasn't getting these kids back, and these kids mean everything to him, and then if Tentley were taking his house away, so he didn't have a home, he's lost his business, and he was being locked up. Moat's friends say he felt his world was collapsing around him. Then Samantha Stobart, his partner of six years and mother of one of his children, broke up with him while he was behind bars. I think it needs to be pointed out they'd been living apart for quite a while, but I think in Sam's mind, she wanted a complete uh, severance of the relationship and, and him being in prison gave her that opportunity and she took that opportunity um, on phone calls to, to remind him that the relationship was finished, it was over, it was final. On her Facebook page, Samantha revised her relationship status to single. Relmote's relationships with women were very troubled. Uh, every relationship he had was characterised by violence. In relation to Samantha Stobart, in his own words, he, didn't, he never punched her. He slapped her, he admitted pushing her, he roughed her up. But because he never punched her, he thought that was OK. 
Samantha came to my place on a few occasions when Raoul had hit her. And she would, I would, I would ask her not to go back, but she would always go back. He would come and pick her up and make her go back. So I was glad he was in prison and I was glad for Samantha he was in prison because it was her chance to break free from him and get away and move on with her life. Knowing Moat could be violent, Samantha warned him that her new partner, Christopher Brown, was a karate instructor and was more than capable of looking after himself. She uses terms like he's a handy lad, he'll put you on his arse, and so, so some of our, our, um, our terminology is quite, you could argue it's quite inflammatory. There's no doubt that she, she lived in fear of moat and she was trying to sort of put some distance between the two, in my mind. Apparently his, his, his soulmates, and that saw a real change in his demeanour and the way he was, the way he was, you know, he was, he was I mean, you're not going to be happy go lucky in prison, but he was, you know, he was reasonably cheerful and friendly. And when he got this phone call, he just changed. Just really, really knocked him for six. Christopher Brown, despite his physical prowess, was a gentleman to those who knew him. My son, Christopher, he was very happy-go-lucky. Um, he was a joy to be with. He was always making you laugh. He was just a lad enjoying life. <sighs> Christopher, how can you describe him? Very larger than life. Um, always laughing. I think I've seen him angry probably five times in our whole growing up together. And he was just, everything was funny to him. Everything. But crucially, in a move that sent her ex ballistic, Samantha told the imprisoned moat that her younger, fitter new boyfriend was also a police officer. She was trying to warn him off, but it was a red rag to a bull like moat. Samantha would have told Raoul that he was a police officer because Samantha was so scared. And she, she maybe would have thought that if, he was a, if she says that, he would leave her alone. Given Moat's simmering hatred of the police, the thought that one of his worst enemies was with his girl pushed him to boiling point. And so, while inside, Moat ordered up a shotgun. The evidence suggests that uh, that was probably when the gun was procured. Um, the, the phone calls used coded language like a car with six wheels, which I would argue was code for a gun and six cartridges. On the day he came out, Moat wrote on his Facebook page, I've lost everything. I'm not 21 and I can't rebuild my life. Watch and see what happens. And so Raoul Moat's carefully laid plan for vengeance began. That afternoon, he was seen on CCTV, dressed in a bright orange T-shirt and buying camping equipment. Gear he'd rely on just 36 hours later. The following day, concerned about his state of mind, prison authorities sent a report to the police saying Moat could pose a serious threat to Samantha Stobart. I think Rob was mentally ill at the time. I think he'd suffered a severe breakdown. And my concern is for my brother, and I, I think had he been possibly re-arrested or apprehended at the gates um, and he'd been treated, things might have been different and this terrible cycle of events might have been prevented. Northumbria police can't comment on the report from Durham Prison as it's still the subject of an ongoing Independent Police Complaints Commission investigation. That same day, Moat's partner in his tree surgery business, Carl Ness, delivered the car with six wheels a sawn-off shotgun with six cartridges. Moat had installed CCTV at his house, um, and it appears that he had installed that to keep an eye on the police and, and, and gather evidence of police harassment. Uh, so for me, it just sort of further underlined his paranoia. But it's, it's quite ironic, I suppose, that the CCTV footage that was recovered from his home address actually showed Carl Ness delivering the gun. Now in possession of a shotgun, Moat set to work adapting its cartridges with lead fishing weights. He wanted the weapon to pack a more deadly punch. Modifying the cartridge means that the, having a single projectile, a um, single projectile will possess all the energy from the shotgun from the cartridge discharge, so that will mean that the projectile can travel further than the individual pellets. 
and when it strikes a target, it could penetrate, you know, to, to a greater depth on the body. It's clear Moat was planning to shoot to kill. In the small hours of Saturday morning, Carl Ness drove Moat to the house where Samantha and Christopher were winding up a night in with friends. An increasingly paranoid Moat hid under the open living room window, texting his pal Ness to say those inside were laughing about him. One text message read, I'm going to kick off nice and proper when they come out. Samantha and Christopher had no idea Moat was carrying a gun, though they were clearly worried about the threat he posed. They decide that they're going to leave, and Chris asks, have I got a bat or anything what he can take with him just in case there's any trouble in the morning? Uh, because we didn't expect any trouble that night. I went upstairs and I got him a bar for my weight bench. And I says, there you go, and I shook his hand, and I says, right, I says, I'll, I'll probably see you tomorrow night, mate. He got to the gate, and out the corner of my eye, I seen somebody running across the grass, and Sam shouted, it's Raul. And then the first shot went off. The first shot, it was like, <laughs> you just, it was a shock. You just didn't expect it, you know, and Sam's screaming, and Chris is staggering across the grass when Raoul takes the second shot of Chris. And Chris took a few more steps and went down on the floor, you know. And Sam, by this time, turned around and she was crying. She ran back into the house. And Raoul just walked up to him calmly and he nudged him in the back with a gun. With a third shot, Raoul Moat killed Christopher Brown. But the shooting wasn't over. Moat had a clear view of Samantha in the well-lit living room. Again, he raised his shotgun and blasted her through the glass. And there's another bang. You already hear Sam say, I've been shot, I've been shot. There's just blood all over the floor. There's blood on the units. She's got a hole in the arm. She was starting to turned white and her lips were turning blue. It was just absolute mayhem. Moat ran from the scene before being caught on CCTV, nonchalantly walking towards a taxi to make good his escape. The morning after murdering Christopher and maiming Samantha, he phoned a friend to brag. I've shot Sam. I feel full of beans, like a huge cloud has been lifted from my shoulders. Father of two, Christopher Brown, wasn't and never had been a police officer. We were at a birthday party for one of the neighbour's children and the police car pulled up and we were all laughing out the front and saying, oh, someone's in trouble again. And they walked over to us and... just came in and he told me what happened. It was horrific. It's one of your worst nightmares. And you, you don't ever think that you're gonna have children and they're gonna die, it's bad enough. God forbid they die of illness, but to die the way he, he, he died, Surrenders. Raoul Moat's vicious attack initially appeared to the police to be an all too common domestic grudge killing. But this was just the start. For the deluded Moat, it was payback time for all those he thought had ever wronged him. It was day one of murderer Raoul Moat's rampage. Northumbria police thought they were dealing with a tragic yet run-of-the-mill grudge shooter.